Praise the Lord God's children, because this is a day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Welcome to the Master's Prayer Room. You know, <clears throat> uh, I'm your host, Dr. Stephanie, and our program is filled with um, the Word of God, followed by our praying with you over your prayer requests. You can send us your prayer request by email prior to the broadcast at mthsprayer at cox.net. That's mthsprayer at cox.net. Now, we know that the power for healing always follows the Word, and because we are a teaching ministry, we always begin with an in-depth explanation and investigation of God's healing power and Spirit-led prayer. Why? Oh, boy, my dog is not feeling well. So we can learn how it works in our lives. Hang on just a second while I let the dog out, because she's not feeling good, and I don't want her to get sick. Come on, Sybil. Come on, Sibby. Go ahead and go out. Go ahead and go out there. You're all right. Mm -hmm. Go out there. You're all right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. She, I have a little chihuahua, and she has uh, issues when she gets overheated. And if it's just hot here, she gets too warm, she throws up. So <laughs> I've already taken her out once this morning, and now she's acting weird. So I'll let her go out in the other part of the house. Um, anyway, we always pray in Thanksgiving, my friends, because we know that that's what move mountains, moves mountains. Praise the Lord. Let's go into the Lord, uh, to the Lord in prayer. Father, we enter your courts with praise and thanksgiving. We thank you that because we know you and love you, you come immediately to inhabit our praises and hearts. Lord, we thank you for your word, revelation, knowledge, and the rhema we receive from it today. And we praise you that the eyes of our hearts are enlightened and we gain complete understanding of what you would impart to us today. And we thank you for the gift of utterance. May your words be my words and my words be yours. In the mighty name above all names, the name of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. Now, I'm going to be talking to you this morning uh, about the benefits of being in Christ. You know, when it comes to benefits of being in Christ, Paul summed it up in Ephesians 1, verse 3, when he wrote, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. I mean, what a wonderful passage to illustrate the benefits of, a, of being a child of God. Think about that. Every spiritual blessing in Christ is ours if we are in the body, the church, and if we love the Lord. Now today I want us to think about some of the benefits and blessings that come to us as a result of our being in the body of Christ. If you're not a child of God today, I hope that these benefits will motivate you to think about your own life and what you're missing if you're not living faithfully before Jesus. What are some of the benefits found in Christ? I'm going to tell you in just a second. But I want you to understand something. I know there's a lot of people out there that say, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a, a child of God because we're all children of God. No, we're not. The children of God, it plainly states in the Bible that the children of God are those that follow Jesus Christ, not just in head, but in heart, that have received him as their personal Savior. If you're not born again, you're not a child of God. You're a child of darkness because your mind's veiled. So you need to accept Jesus as Savior, and then you become a child of God, and you'll have eternal life. Now, some of the benefits found in Christ. First, redemption is found only in Jesus Christ. The word redeem means to buy back. A good image of this comes from the Old Testament, where some might have been sold as a slave. Then, when the year of Jubilee arrived, the price could be paid and that person could be bought back. That's the idea of being redeemed. We sold ourselves to sin, but Jesus paid the price necessary to buy us back. This principle is illustrated in Romans chapter 3, verse 24, where Paul said that we have been justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus is the only way that people can be brought back together with God. It was sin that severed that relationship in Isaiah 59, 1-2, through 2, and all of us have sinned, Romans 3, 23. But for that chasm to be spanned, and for us to be bought back, or brought back, into fellowship with God, we must be in Christ. Jesus gave his life as a ransom to buy us back, and Revelation 5 is a bittersweet scene. John sees some scrolls, but no one can be found to open them, and as a result, John begins to weep bitterly. Then the scene changes from that sad and despondent vision to a beautiful image. He looks up and sees the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world. Then the Lamb is able to open the scrolls and redeem those who had all their lifetime been held bondage by sin. 
Jesus came to bring salvation to all people, my friends, and God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2.4 There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5 Christ brings God and man together because he is the propitiation, the substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. Yet, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. 1 John 2.2 2. The price that Jesus paid to redeem us was his own life. Galatians 1.4 And Jesus was willing to buy us back with his own life. Titus 2.14 says that he gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every, every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. The text of 1 Peter 2.24 speaks of Christ, who himself bore our sins in his own body, on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. If you're not in Christ, then you have not been bought back. You're still separated from God. But one of the benefits of being in Christ is that you can have an intimate relationship with God through his Son, Jesus. Another benefit of being in Christ is that there is no con condemnation. To those who are followers of Jesus, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Okay? Or those who are in Christ. On the day of judgment, when we stand before God, if we have lived faithfully, we will not hear these words. Cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That statement is not for a child of God, because there is no condemnation in Christ. Now notice what Paul said about this in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now if we are children of God, we have the promise that we will not be condemned for all eternity. There is, however, condemnation for those who refuse to obey the gospel. Mark 16.16 16 often is remembered for its statement about salvation, but the latter part warns us about condemnation when it says, He who does not believe will be condemned. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, we are told that Jesus will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, these people will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of God. Of the Lord, I mean, presence of the Lord. Think about Luke 16, where we find the account of Lazarus and the rich man in the reversed roles. In this life, the rich man had everything, but Lazarus was a beggar. Both men died. Lazarus was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom, while the rich man awoke in torment in the Hedean realm. Now, he had what we would have to be the most horrible situation, figure of to be the most horrible situation imaginable. I mean, he was spending eternity lost, where there was weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Revelation 21 8 says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But because Christ has overcome sin, we too can overcome sin. Revelation 3.21 teaches us, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. God will not condemn faithful Christians the way he condemns those who have remained in the world. If we remain faithful until Judgment Day, then we can have boldness. In 1 John 2.25 we are told this is the promise that he promised us, eternal life. Living faithfully in Jesus means that instead of receiving condemnation, we receive the promised blessing of eternal life. Titus 1.2 says that we live in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. Okay, another benefit of being in Christ is that we have victory in Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 15.57 we read, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christians have not been defeated. Christ, although he was crucified, became the victor. He defeated the devil. Now, if we follow Christ, we too can have that victory. One of the most beautiful passages to illustrate victory in Christ is 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through, through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. As we go out, not only does the aroma of Christ go with us, but because we are in Christ, we are able to go out triumphantly because we have won the battle. We need to realize today that we are in a battle. The devil walks about like a roaring lion, like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. 1 Peter 5.8 Now from the time of Genesis 3, when the devil in the form of a slithering serpent approached Eve until the present day, man has been in a battle for his soul. 
In 2 Corinthians 10, 2 through 5, we are told that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Right now we are in a battle for our souls. We need to take the time to properly prepare ourselves. Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 17 teaches us that we must put on the whole armor of God so that we can stand against the wiles of the devil. If we do that, and if we fight the battle against Satan every day, we are already the winner of that battle. Christ has won, thus we have won. The victor has already been decided. The end result is not undetermined. It's not like a baseball or football game where we don't know what was going to be the outcome. You know, the outcome is this. Christians have already won by being in Christ. The question is, will we be faithful and lay hold of that victory? Paul discussed this victory in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, when he wrote this. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Those of us who love and obey Jesus are promised that if we fight the good fight and if we finish the race, we will receive the crown of righteousness that has been laid up for us. The victory is ours if we remain true to Jesus all the days of our lives. Another wonderful blessing of being in Christ is that we get a second chance. Just think of how many people would like to have a second chance in life so that they could wipe out the slate clean. In regard to all the things that previously had been done and have had those things no more remembered against them. <laughs> all right. Hebrews 8:12. Being in Christ means that we get a second chance. Consider the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 5:17 which illustrate what it really means to have a second chance in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Okay. You're going to hear that a lot from me because I'm a harp, and I just harp on that all the time. The life we once lived in sin no longer exists, my friends. It has been wiped from the memory of God and will not be held against us. Before coming, becoming Christians, we were dead in sin. Ephesians 2.12 speaks of people who were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, Romans um, 23 just a minute, I'm looking for the... Romans 3, verse 23, tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All right? And that's true. And Ecclesiastes 7.20 reminds us, there is not a just man on earth who does not sin, who does good and does not sin. I'm sorry. I, I was paraphrasing. Paul summed it up in Romans 6.23 by saying, the wages of sin is death. All right, now, all of us at one time uh, we're dead in sin and we're headed for the sinner's doom. But thanks to be to God that Romans 6.17 is in the Bible. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Let me illustrate this for you if, you, if I can. Imagine that you were in the middle of nowhere. It's about noon and you decide to look for a place to eat. Way in the distance on the horizon you see a restaurant. As you get closer you approach it and see on the sign the following words. The old shack. When you pull up to it, you see that it's not very appealing to the eye. There are potholes in the parking lot. The sign is hanging unevenly. There are shingles missing from the roof. And as you look inside, there's grease everywhere and lots and lots of bugs. In short, it's just not a place you think you would like to eat. It's a greasy spoon, what we call a greasy spoon. So you decide to go somewhere else. But later you come back that same way, and once again you're hungry. This time, however, the place has been completely cleaned up. It has been painted, the shingles have been repaired, the potholes have been filled, the glasses are clean, and the sign outside says, Same old shack under new management. That's what it means to have a second chance. Our bodies are the same old shacks, but now they are under new management. We have been given a second chance, which means that we must decide to straighten up, live right, and do God's will. We have a new focus. Romans 6, 4 says that we are to walk in newness of life. We are to be faithful to Jesus all the days of our lives. Revelation 2.10 teaches us to be faithful unto death. We must be good examples to those in the world. 1 Timothy 4.12 Thus, one of the wonderful benefits of being in Christ is that we get to start over again. We get a second chance every day. Another benefit of being in Christ was mentioned earlier in Ephesians 1.3, but is worth noting again. As a child of God, the fact that I am in Christ means that I have access to every spiritual blessing. Think about that. Every spiritual blessing that God has afforded his people is to be found in Christ. 
Let's turn our attention to Ephesians 1.3, where Paul emphasized this point. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. What are some of the blessings that are ours? What about the privilege of being a child of God? Talk about a spiritual blessing. That is it. The very fact that we can be considered a child of, God, of the creator of the universe and that we can look up and say, Our Father who art in heaven, uh, in um, uh, Matthew 6, 9, is astonishing. John described it in 1 John 3, 1 this way, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. What an honor and a privilege it is uh, to be adopted sons and daughters of God, Galatians 4, 4 through 6. We have a God who loves us more than we could ever imagine. Now another spiritual blessing is the heavenly inheritance that we have been promised. As a child of God, one of the things to which each of us can look forward to is that one day we will live with God in heaven. Now in reality, we're not citizens of the world in which we actually live. We may live in Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, or some other state. But Paul said in Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. One day we're going to be changed. And that's where our true heavenly inheritance represents such a blessing. Another benefit to being in Christ is that the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who have been faithful, yet who have passed from this life, are promised that they will be resurrected with Christ when he returns. Now that's the rapture. Turn your attention to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, where Paul teaches us that the children of God who have died will be the first to join the Lord. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. One of the blessings of being in Christ is that death no longer has dominion over us. The power of death, the sting of death, and the sting of sin, 1 Corinthians 15, 51-57, have all been defeated by Jesus so that death no longer haunts us. Think about the one thing that most people fear, death. Revelation 14:13 says death is a blessing for Christians. How does a Christian look at death? This is one of the richest blessings that a person could ever envision. For a child of God, death is looked upon as a wonderful thing, a great blessing. John wrote, Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, the spirit that they may... Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Their works follow them. In other words, whatever you've done here for Christ follows you. Did you notice the language? It says, blessed are the dead who die in the faith, or in the Lord. Death is viewed as a good thing. How many people in this life take the approach that death is a blessing? Not many. Psalm 116.15 puts it in even more magnificent language. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. God views the death of one of his children as a precious thing. It is a going home for the child of God. Paul thought in this manner because in Philippians 1.21 he wrote this, For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We must come to the realization that this life is not going to last forever. Psalm 90 verses 9 through 10 tells us that our lives are but a sigh and that if we are fortunate we might have 70 or 80 years to live. Life is short for each of us. I am reminded of the words of 1 Samuel 20 verse 3 where David said, there is but a step between me and death. Each of us could say that. James 4.14 describes life as a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Probably some of the most graphic language is found in 2 Samuel 14.14. 14. We will surely die and become like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. None of us is going to live forever, folks. One day we will die. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. But here's the good news. Being in Christ means that all the people at your funeral who are there to mourn your loss will know that you have passed on to something better. In God's sight, that truly is a blessing. Now, another benefit is this. Um, I want to say this about death. The Lord showed me this, and it is a benefit. He, he, I was questioning him about death and, and uh, the crossing over because I've sat with very many people who have passed, some who have born again, some not. And they all die differently, but the Christians all die peacefully. They just exhale and are gone. Okay, and this is what the Lord told me. A Christian, a born-again believer, will exhale, his spirit leaves his body, and the next breath he takes, which is like normal breathing to us, we don't even know we've stopped breathing, breathing in the flesh. We just exhale, and the next breath we inhale, we're in heaven in the presence of God. That's how easy it is. But if you're not born again, it's a fight.
because there's fear there and you don't know where you're going, but you think you know that you will know where you're going as soon as you're on your deathbed. Now, another benefit of being in Christ is that it is where God's grace is found. Think about the connection between God's grace and the salvation that is found only in Christ. Jesus is the epitome of God's grace on earth. Um, Titus 2.11 teaches us this. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Grace has appeared. So where is it? Well, notice John 1.17. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Yes, God's grace is available. And yes, it is God's grace that saves us. Ephesians 2.8-9. But we cannot be saved by the grace of God outside of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the epitome of God's grace. Now, in 2 Corinthians 8 through 9, or chapter 8, verse 9, Paul wrote, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that, through, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. God's grace is embodied in the sacrifice and death of his Son on the cross. If we're going to be saved, we must access the grace of God that's available only in Christ. In 2 Timothy 2.10, we read, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So, if grace is in Christ and if salvation is in Christ, then we need to ask, are we in Christ, where all these spiritual blessings are found? If we are not in Christ, then what must we do to get inside Christ? Galatians 3.27 gives us the answer to that question. But right now we have to go to our, our uh, uh, prayer request, <laughs> or we won't have time. Okay. We're going to start with Jack. We're continuing our prayer vigil of Thanksgiving for Jack. We have a, a, come up against a very stubborn spirit that's working on him to steal his memory, his mind, and his life. So please hang in there with your prayers, prayer warriors. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that we are not moved by what we see with our natural eyes. We praise you that the efforts of the enemy fail miserably. We give you thanks and praise for the restoration of Jack's mind and memory. Warriors, please continue praying in agreement for his complete restoration and healing. Father God, we bind all evil darts that are sent his way. We bind the spirit of confusion. We loose ministering angels to work on the restoration of his physical mind and memory. We thank you, Lord, that he is totally aware of who he is in Christ and embraces that. And he hangs on to it in times of trial. We are continually looking toward our expected end, Lord. Total healing, wholeness, and permanent restoration for Jack's mind and memory. We bind and cast down the spirit of deaf and dumb, confusion, memory loss, and mental dependency on others and declare that at the name of Jesus, the name dementia has to bow and flee. We stand together in faith and agreement in seeing the reversal and complete annihilation of the enemy's plan to steal Jack's memory and mind and his life. We come against all those who speak evil mind-altering verbiage to Jack's mind and, bend them, and bind them uh, from speaking. And we cast down any words that are meant to alter Jack's mind to naught. We call these individuals mute in the name of Jesus. To, be, to God be all the glory for the restoration of Jack's divine health and wholeness. And we thank you, Lord, in the mighty and awesome name of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen. You know, I didn't have any other prayer re requests this week, so I'm going to um, finish with this. You know, because there's a whole lot of people that contact us for prayer, it's impossible to include them all in our broadcast sessions. I include in, in these sessions those that have re had reversals or need continued uplifting, as well as requests that haven't been prayed for or need special attention. And as these requests come in, I pray for all of them that I have received pre-broadcast. However, um, uh, there, there is a lot of cries for help that come in after we start the program. So let, let's say a prayer for all of those suffering, sick, and oppressed. Just cover everybody. Father, we are in your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts and on our lips. We adore you, Lord, and love you because you first loved us. Lord, now we love you because of who you are. Once we know you and taste of your goodness, we can't get enough of you. Today we lift up all those who are suffering from sickness and disease and those who are oppressed of the devil to you. You know their situations. We thank you that their life issues are healed and restored to your peace and tranquility. We praise you that your health has been administered to them and imparted to them and that their health is strengthened and that they walk in your divine health and wholeness. We give you thanks and praise for the abundance that you shower them with in their lives, in their ministries, and in their walk with you. And we thank you, Lord, that they always keep their eyes on you and run to you for direction and protection and peace. In Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you that you watch over your word to perform it and that our prayers that line up with your will are always answered yes and amen. 
Therefore, we thank you that all are completely rescued from all strongholds that encumber them, that they are healed in the powerfully explosive, universally almighty name above all names, Jesus, Word of God Almighty, and made whole and completely restored. Amen. Well, that's all I have today, and I want you to invite you to join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time for the Master's Touch Worship Service on Ustream.tv. These worship services include praise and worship, soaking worship, the Word of God, Holy Communion, and an opportunity for salvation, along with a visitation from the Holy Spirit for all who will receive. Come worship the Lord with us, expecting to receive every Sunday at 10 a.m. on Ustream.tv. Then, on Tuesdays, um, we have... At 8 a.m., just what we did have a minute ago, a little while ago, or at 8 a.m., yeah, Pacific Time on Ustream.tv, the Master's Touch Healing Service. And these are full healing services, and they include praise and worship, soaking worship, the Word of God, Holy Communion, and the laying on of hands, and a visitation from the Holy Spirit with your healing touch. Again, that's the Master's Touch Streaming Live Healing Services, Tuesdays at 8 a.m. on Ustream.tv. Now, another thing that I want to tell you about that is so new is... Um, our uh, new master class, the Master's Touch Master Class. That's every day, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Those those three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, uh, of each week. And they are discipleship classes into the body of Christ, not into a denomination, not into uh, the family of God or anything like that. I mean, whatever they want to, uh, uh, not uh, denomination or uh, doctrine. Okay. That's what I'm saying. But into the body of Christ. And we are going to go in depth. These are ministry level classes, but they're for the believer. It doesn't matter if you're going into ministry or not. You need to understand this. Pastors take these classes in, in Bible college so that they can learn who God is, who Christ is, who they are, and what they're supposed to be doing so that they can teach you and preach it to you. Come and join us. See if you like the classes. I know you'll be blessed. Uh, we're going to start from the very beginning of creation, and we're going to go back through to not the end, but to our our beginning in eternal life. And we're going to explain it all to you in vi minute detail so that you can gain understanding of who you are, why you're here, what God's mapped out plan was for your life, and so on. Okay? And then you can be obedient to it. And so be sure that you come, and when you do, come expecting to receive. All right? Well, for information on all of the Master's programming schedules, you go to www.themasterstouch.org. That's themasterstouch.org. I want to let you know, too, that all of the Master Classes will be archived on Spreaker.com. It's a radio, internet radio program, and uh, we'll be doing the classes on that. If you can't make it to them in person, which I, I heartily suggest that you do, but if you can't, they will be archived on Spreaker.com for your, for your uh, future study and also on the masterstouch.org, my website, so that you can go in and study at your leisure. All right. Now be sure and contact us at masterstouchhs at, at cox.net. That's masterstouchhs at, uh, at cox.net, mthsprayer at cox.net, and poet at cox.net. I look forward to seeing you all Sunday through Thursday for the Master's Word broadcast. Have a wonderful Jesus-filled week. Proverbs 4, 7 tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all you're getting, get understanding. And make sure you're keeping Jesus Lord of your life. Amen? God bless you. The Master's Word is an extension of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We're a 501c3 organization. Now remember this, my friends. The Word of God tells us in 1 John 4.17 that as Jesus is, so are we in this world. God bless you.